I invite you to please be seated. Wow, what a beautiful, beautiful day. I'm Carmen Blanco Hartfield, and I am the oldest daughter, oldest child. And looking out on your beautiful faces, if mom were here, she would say, what an honor it is to have so many friends and family members here. You have come from near and far and I'm so happy to see you. And I know she is looking down on you today, and she is so happy to see you. Our family is thankful for your presence here today, and your many prayers have lifted us up through this difficult time. We're especially grateful for your prayers and extraordinary kindnesses that carried mom to her many miracles over the last 22 months. We do have some special thanks. James Davison, Virginia Boulay, Alvin Albee, Richard Zuschlag, Errol Babineau. You opened your homes and transported mom to her treatments, giving us time and some of the most precious treasured family memories that we will love forever. Your love for her and us will be etched in our hearts forever. Kim, Kimberly, Father Chester, Jimmy, Clay, Governor Edwards, Marilyn, and so many others, thank you, thank you for joining with us to create the most spectacular and fitting goodbye for a tremendous lady. These three days truly, truly honored her legacy. My mother spent her last 25 days at St. Joseph's Carpenter House inpatient hospice. Our beloved grandmother came to her bedside daily, giving her strength and courage the way only a mother can do. Mama, you were such a comfort to her and to us. Thank you. Words cannot express our gratitude to our aunts and uncles, mom's siblings and their spouses, Cece and Michael and Susie and Chris for the tremendous support that you gave us. You were in the trenches with us side by side every single day. You were the sweetest gifts from God to her and to each of us, thank you. The team at Carpenter House, wow, what a hug that place is. You are the definition of love in action. To those of you in our food train, thank you for the pots of love you sent to nourish us. So, you know, you are all here today because of one thing. Love, love. You knew without a doubt that you were loved unconditionally by our mother. To be in her life meant that you received patience and kindness from her. She celebrated your victories, never wishing they were hers. She did not boast. She was instead so humble. She lovingly showered you with praise and kindness and was so generous. She did not keep record of wrongs. She instead prayed for you when she thought you were a little wayward. She lived in the truth and for the truth of salvation and never ever cowered in the face of evil until her final breath she never gave up on faith, 
and hope. With enduring patience, she persevered. Although she is gone, her love has left an eternal mark on each of us and the world. She understood that wisdom and knowledge were only part of the picture and that the perfect love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were hers and yours for all eternity. Her life was a stream of love that flowed across the earth, sweeping people into a warm embrace. It is no coincidence that this description of how she loved us seems familiar. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8 tells us the definition of love, which is patient, kind, not jealous, conceited, or proud. It's not ill-mannered, selfish, or irritable. Love does not keep a record of wrongs, is not happy with evil, but is happy with the truth. Love never gives up, and its faith, hope, and patience never fail. Love is eternal. Knowing her, as many, most, probably all of you do, she probably wrote down this list of what the definition of love was and applied it to every aspect of her life. One cannot separate mom's prestigious career from her faith and family because every aspect of her life was the living out of her faith with her family. Monique said it best when she remarked one day while we were traveling with mom to an event. She said, you know, people like mom, they have people. You ever noticed we're mom's people? I was like, you know, that's a really good way to put it. And that just stayed with me forever. When I looked at my mom, I always knew I was one of her people. My greatest takeaway from her was learning how to live a peaceful and satisfied life. She took one day at a time, never really planning the be next best thing or big thing to come. She instead lived in awe of her mighty yet wonderful God as she let him make all of the plans for her life. She believed that worrying was pointless because it fruited nothing and ruined the peace of the present. She also thought that worrying meant that she didn't trust God to work everything out for her good. So she just didn't do it. As she battled the ravages of ocular melanoma, it was your prayers that lifted her spirit and miraculously kept her from feeling the wrath of this terrible disease for nearly two years longer than expected. For those who prayed for healing, you can rest assured your prayers have now been answered, for she is rejoicing in the warm brace of sweet Jesus, and she has been completely healed and cured of the cancer that made her suffer so much. In classic KBB style, she had a meeting with God, and she submitted a list of the people she wanted to watch over when she got to heaven. She was hoping not to have to be too busy because she wanted to rest. Her faith in God and the promise of heaven was so great to her that she actually made plans of how she was going to spend her time in eternity. Like, there's no doubt if you plan it. <laughs> I mean, that is such an inspiration. So mom faced her cancer courageously, never ever once fearing death. With convicted faith, she was peaceful as we gathered around her, escorting her to heaven where Christ welcomed her home to rejoicing angels. She was reunited with our brother Ben, Uncle Buzzy, Papa, and a jubilant assembly of thousands of friends and family who had gone before her. Mom, we know you are smiling down on us from heaven, showering us with love, and sending God's peace to us because we know we made the list. And because we know you would not miss this glorious celebration of your beautiful life. When I was a child, we would say my nighttime prayers. When she would leave my room, I would keep talking to God. And I would thank him for picking me to be her child. 
And then I would think of all the kids who didn't get picked, and I would just say, how did I get picked? How? How did I get picked? I never understood how I got so lucky to be picked to be her kid. I just, from, that's one of my earliest memories of my love for her. I love you so much, sweet mama, and I will carry you in my heart forever. The end of mom's life has been profound for me and for so many. Being a part of her walk through death was heartbreaking and painful, but it was full of love and peace and intent and consciousness and the most beautiful experience I've ever had. This week of services have also been beautiful. Thank you all for being here for your love and for your support. Many conversations over the last two days have been about the fact that mom did the right thing. Over and over you hear she did the best she could. She was good. She did great things. You don't really realize the depth of her impact until you start talking to the people that she changed their lives. To everyday people who came because she changed their lives, that has been the most touching part of the last few days for me. Government was formed to solve common problems that are too large in scope for any individual or individuals to do on their own. Good, good government is tedious and often painstaking. It takes, much, it takes much forethought and planning, usually without much recognition. And good government at its core takes collaboration of the people affected. All of that is somewhat boring until you mix in power and money. And then we call it politics. Mom was good at both politics and government, but her ability to govern is what defined her. She was not in it for money or power, and I don't have to tell any of you that. She was simply in it to do good things. The secret, which is not really a secret, to her success was her ability to govern within her faith. Each day, she made a personal choice to open her, art, her heart to ask, what do you have for me today, God? How can I serve you? She claimed her personal power by letting God set her path each day of her life. It was a choice, it is a choice that each one of us have the ability to make, but it is not easy. The power she had from prayer is that she could move forward in any situation with a clear and direct path without knowing the answers or the outcome and she did not need credit. It was good every time. There is great freedom in life when you surrender your days and your work on, God, on earth to God. She had that freedom and that power. The Louisiana Poet Laureate under her administration, Daryl Bork, wrote a poem this week. He read it Thursday at the services in Baton Rouge. I asked him if I could read it again today, and he said he would be honored. The Governance of Power by Daryl Bork for Kathleen Babineau Blanco. Power is a woman who looks directly into a camera, says a defining moment in her life was the loss of a son. Power is a woman who always writes her own scripts. Power is a woman who takes 15 years off to raise children. Carmen then Monique, Nicole, Ray, Pilar, and beloved Ben. Power is a woman who cares about the health of others first. Power is a woman who teaches and then teaches teachers. She teaches them to build schools from the inside. Power is a woman who falls in love with the one Blanco she knows she'll spend the rest of her life with, and does. Power is a woman fearless of foreign tongues and places. Power is a woman never hedging when it comes to her God, how she will walk with him and talk to him 
and rest in him. Power is a woman who can say, I am a powerful woman, and I don't say that because I was governor. She says, I'm not powerful because I wield power, then or now, but because I claim personal power, and I claim that power to define my personal happiness. She says this to students at the beginning of a new phase of their lives, at the last phase of hers. She says, I suggest you give yourself that gift too. All power comes from a big heartedness and a plan, from hope and faith. She's saying, give yourself that gift too. Many of you have said to me and to my siblings this week that we have her legacy to carry on. That's a tall task. The poem ends with her words, give yourself that gift too. She was not just talking to us. She was talking to you also. So I am flipping your kind words about her legacy back onto you. We all have her legacy to carry on, and it starts with faith. That's it. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Raymond Blanco, Jr. Um, as you can tell by the comb over. <laughs> Since I'm such a mess these days, uh, I break down, I'm fine, break down again, I'm fine again. Uh, honestly, who on earth is worth it more than mom? Anyway, <clears throat> to get through this reflection, I want to read a prayer. This is to help me to calm my nerves and remind me so much of mom. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. I don't know the uh, earliest childhood memory of my mother, my Genesis with my mom, if you will. Um, took place in a, the one-acre backyard on Edgewood. A lot of you remember that place. Um, it's about 120-foot tall pine trees, about a 12 to 15-foot hedgerow of azaleas, some camellias, mimosas sprinkled throughout there, uh, and it was beautiful. Uh, and that was a Garden of Eden to a child. One spring day, um, while all the flowers were in full bloom, I walked out into the middle of the yard. I was probably two, maybe three years old, just a small toddler. I vividly remember the volume and the brilliant color of a flight of f fighting, screaming, and just raging blue jays. And they were dive bombing this azalea bush. And I was just mesmerized by how beautiful this was and how loud they were. And I, I was walking across that yard. I was worried that they would be scared of me and they would fly away, but they didn't. They didn't show any fear of me at all. They didn't even notice that I was there. And I would have walked right up to try to catch one, but mom called my name, so I stopped. But I didn't stop staring at those birds, and I'll never forget just how they were right there. Right? I could almost reach up and touch those birds. And but over my shoulder comes a shovel, and it's a spade, and it knocks a copperhead snake about that long and about that wide right out of the bush onto the ground. 
And I look up, and it's mom, and she just chops the head off of the snake. She spins the shovel, takes the head of the snake, and flips it off into the bushes. And I'm looking down at the ground at this flailing, bleeding of a giant snake. And I look up at my mother, and she leans on the shovel, and she puts her hands on her, my head, and she says, well, no, that was close, wasn't it? Uh, Mom has always been a fearless protector of not just her children, but all of God's defenseless youth. She knew what she was doing. I can tell you many more snakes fell in that backyard to that shovel. Those blue jays were protecting their nests. They were protecting their young. <clears throat> joke number one. Oh, I'm not supposed to read that. That was a joke. <laughs> what do they say about an honest politician's children? They have to work for a living. <laughs> and in my occupation as an occupational safety professional, I do two things on a regular basis. One is proactive. I trend information, see patterns so that I can help predetermine outcomes. The other is causal analysis. I collect information, <clears throat> identify contributing factors, narrow down the data to a single point, determine a root cause. Some interesting data I've been trending is the stories being told and written about mom. I haven't read them all, but the ones that keep getting sent to me have a common theme. And this is even the most adversarial reporters. They are all writing very similar articles. They're telling very personal stories of how mom touched them or treated them as people. <clears throat> how human and considerate she was during her most trying times. The other thing I do is I find root cause. And what would cause several hundred people over the last several days, weeks, months, who have expressed to me the many different ways mom has personally affected them and in so many different profound ways it was. I keep asking, what is the single source of mom's superpower? She's our mother. We know her, we love her. Everybody in here knew her and loved her. How did she do that? What was her secret? Where did she get her unshakable faith? Where did she derive her strength, her fortitude, her courage, her leadership, her sincere humility, her kindness, but more impressively, how did she make these things look so effortless and natural? I had to pray to dig to find a singular quality, a singular character quality. <clears throat> that made each of those amazing qualities next level possible, personally and professionally. I always attributed to her tireless effort I always believed that was her superpower. However, here at the end, I realized there was something else. Kathleen Blanco's secret to success is effortless, and it will live beyond her pulse. It is her sincere gratitude, grateful to God, regardless of the challenges, and they were many and they were grand. Grateful for her family, her friends, her team, her constituents. Grateful to talk to every person she ever met. St. Ignatius states that the lack of gratitude is the root of all sin. Logically, sincere gratitude then becomes key to all other success. And no challenge is too much. Not even our own certain mortality. What is a sincere gratitude without thank you? And we've got a few of them. Uh, one that was left off in the earlier thank yous, Corman, um, was uh, Jim Bernhardt and Jeff Jenkins. Thank you for your support as well in those uh, many, many round trips to Houston and to Memphis and to Philadelphia. And it was a grueling, grueling time for everybody. And a special thank you to my sisters 
who stepped from their lives and fought that fight with my mother every step of the way. Uh, my father, my grandmother. Your support is unbelievable. To each of you for your prayers, you carried us through this moment and you continue to carry us through life. I'd also like to take a quick special thanks to everyone who worked in any capacity that made these three days a tribute to mom a reality. Father Chester, Kim Hunter Reed, Jimmy Clark, Kimberly Robinson, Marilyn Crane, Louisiana State Police Detail, the Color Guard, Governor John Bell Edwards, First Lady Donna Edwards, for everything you're doing for the state of Louisiana and for your tireless effort devoted to the least amongst us. You made mom grateful. You make all of our family grateful. Thank you. I want to take the opportunity to thank each person in the pews and those of you on television. Thank you for your past political support of our mother, volunteering, donating, and voting. Without your belief in the person, the candidate, none of this would be possible. Thank you for expressing your voice. The world hears you. One more thank you. Our family uh, works as many gears. I practiced this a lot last night, so actually until about 4 o'clock this morning. So I'm going to try to get this right. Mom and pop, my sisters, our spouses, grandchildren, we're all moving parts, and we move. When any of us gets out of whack, we kind of all get out of whack. But then we all kind of bring each other back together. <laughs> Thank y'all for everybody working to bring us all back together. <laughs> Mama, aunts, uncles, thank you for holding us in your hands. Back to the machine. Pop, you got a roll in this machine. You pour the fuel. Sometimes a little too much fuel. <laughs> but you keep us running, brother. Mom, she drove the machine. We will always love her for that. But this thank you isn't about just this machine. This thank you is in particular for one person. This thank you goes to Father Chester Arsenault. And I'm not just saying this because your boss and his boss are here. I'm saying it because all of our boss is here. <laughs> thank you for your spiritual guidance, your emotional support. Thank you for your patience. <clears throat> Recognizing that the Blancos are not rule breakers or particularly rule followers, we are rule rewriters. <laughs> but mostly, thank you for filling a role in our family that nobody could have possibly filled but you. <clears throat> Through this process, unwittingly, you, you played Ben's role all along. And thank you for being grateful to do it. And my final thank goes to Thank you goes to God for a mother and a father I can truly call my heroes. Thank you all. I'm Nicole Blanco, the third, my mom's favorite third, in case y'all never knew that. Um, thank you for all being here today. It's a testament to who my mother was. My daughter Angela waving who loved her mom too very much. Um, I just wanted to say my mother was unconditional. She was kind, she was loving. And I did not have to grow up to look back and reflect upon that. I knew that from a very, very young age, that we were very different than some families um, and blessed in having someone who was so patient with us. She was our calm, she was our steady. She was my safe place. So I will miss her greatly. If I could take away one thing, it would be the unconditional mother and father, um, excuse me, mother to my father and wife that she was to him. 
And if I can just have a fraction of that to my daughter and to John, I I'll be very blessed. She was wonderful, and thank you all for loving her like you did, supporting her and being there for her throughout these years. When I look in the crowd, I recognize everybody, and it's a blessing. So thank you to everyone. I promise I'll be brief. Um, I'm Pilar, Kathleen's fourth daughter. Quick to point out, I'm not technically the baby. That's a role Ben will forever hold. Um, I learned, I just wanted to share about her final journey home, um, something that we was very intimate to us, that we were all there to witness. Um, I learned more in the last two years about this rare disease called ocular melanoma that chose my mother than I ever wanted to know. In her usual fashion, it was her keeping us calm, not concerned with herself or her pain and suffering, and how she was more concerned about how her illness affected us. While I still feel cheated out of the 30 plus years we were supposed to have, we were all convinced she'd outlive Mama. The gift of time we had and the lessons learned are ones I will cherish for the rest of my life. While my dad laments about how four strong-willed daughters, we all sprung into the action with the skills he taught us of resourcefulness and problem solving that he taught us so masterfully. She showed immense grace and strength through the whole journey. Our trips to Philadelphia for treatment, while somber, were something I will cherish forever. We would try to make them fun, doing something that first night, shopping, eating out, seeing plays. You would never know she was going into major surgery the next day. It was like a little mini girl's trip for a grueling procedure she would repeat six times to give us more time with her. Our last 25 days at St. Joseph Carpenter House were also a gift in so many ways. In true Blanco fashion, we screamed, we fought, we cried, we hugged, we loved, we laughed. Come to think of it, I don't remember much debating. It must have been there were too many babinos around for us to really talk politics. I still don't know how my grandma votes. I, I, I assume you voted for mom. <laughs> the friends and family we call our village were amazing. The support she received was a witness to her life. Our sweet aunts and uncles and friends would come and relieve us, but we would never leave. Go take care of your children, go to work. And we wouldn't leave her side. We knew how precious each of those moments were next to her. The beautiful nurses who were so kind and loving were in awe of her graceful handling of this disease and impending death. It was not just once, but probably once a day we would hear, well, she's not typical. This is new. We've never seen this. We don't know. This never happened. She was not following any pattern, of course, and there were few answers because she defied the norm until the end. We learned in death, you go out the way you lived. Mom had great attention to detail, turning out every light, making sure every dish was put away, taking care of everything, making my dad insane as they tried to get out the door. She ran through her checklist before she went, checking off everything, including my birthday, Ray's birthday, my dad's birthday, and their 55th wedding anniversary. And thankfully for the final arrival of medical marijuana, she was able to enjoy that day, day for, with my dad and with us, talking and visiting and sharing and laughing. One day I asked her, one day I asked her if she was worried about Papa, letting her know we would take good care of him, knowing that's the last thing he wants. She answered me, I will always worry about Papa, but I'm glad I out that heart issue and he seems to be doing better. And then about five minutes later, she kind of wakes up from a slumber and says to me, please make sure he stops eating so many ready-made bakery items. <laughs> Tell him to eat coleslaw and have hops and not much chili. <laughs> so she's managing his diet in heaven as we speak, thinking that I'll actually make a difference, as she couldn't for 84 years. My mom was our glue after Ben's death and it was her mission to keep us together. And I'm sure many of you are worried without our glue what may happen to us. Well, Mom, you succeeded again. 
with all the stress and heartache of watching you suffer and go through this last trial. I've witnessed beauty, light, and love in each of my siblings, and whether we like it or not, we are bonded in this life and in the next. Thank you all. May she share with him eternal glory. I invite the family to please come up and place the pall upon her casket.
casket of crucifix reminding us of the sacrifice of our Savior but also reminding us that it is through his sacrifice we find new life in him in the resurrection as Kathleen placed her hope in her faith in the Lord Jesus now may she share in his glory I invite you to please be seated for a moment. Good morning, everyone. Along with my brother bishops and priests who are gathered here this morning, and indeed the entire diocese of Lafayette, I wish to extend to you, Coach, and to your family deepest condolences and sympathies. We gather this morning to celebrate this funeral mass as we gather around the table of the Lord to celebrate the sacrifice which redeemed the world, to be nourished with the the bread of life, which promises those who are nourished by it will be sharers in the resurrection of the Lord. This morning, to offer this sacrifice as well as our prayers for the happy repose of the soul of Governor Blanc, that having shared in the cross of Christ and in the sufferings of Christ, she now share in resurrection to everlasting life. Please stand. Let us pray. O oh God, our nature is always to forgive and to show mercy. We humbly implore you for your servant Kathleen, whom you have called to journey to you. And since she hoped and believed in you, grant that she may be led to our true homeland to delight in its everlasting joys. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever.
A reading from the Book of Wisdom. Love righteousness, you who judge the earth. Think of the Lord in goodness and seek him in integrity of heart, because he is found by those who do not test him and manifests himself to those who do not disbelieve him. For perverse counsels separate people from God, and his power put to the proof rebukes the foolhardy. Because into a soul that plots evil, wisdom does not enter, nor does she dwell in a body under debt of sin. For the Holy Spirit of discipline flees deceit and withdraws from senseless counsels and is rebuked when unrighteousness occurs. The word of the Lord. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to St. Timothy. For being poured out of libation, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have did well. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, righteousness awaits me, which the Lord, the just judge, will award to me on that day, and not to me, but to all long for his appearance. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A gospel according to Matthew.
when he saw the cross, he went up. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for they are the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and all every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward will be great in heaven though they persecuted the prophets who are before you. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning. I am the Chester Arsenault, the rector of this cathedral of St. John the Evangelist, pastor and friend of the former governor Kathleen Blanco and her family. On behalf of Kathleen and her family, I thank you for your love and support you have shown to her in these last few years, but especially in these last few months and days. Thank you to Bishop Desitel, the Bishop of our Diocese of Lafayette for your words of comfort. Bishop Emeritus Gerald for your presence here today along with my brother priests, religious brothers, sisters, and deacons who are gathered here. It means so much for the family. I welcome Bishop Amon and I thank you for your words at the interfaith service that was inspirational, honoring the legacy of the former governor. And, and I also thank Bishop Duca for your kindness and your hospitality to the family and to our time there in celebrating her life. I welcome all dignitaries who are present today. It's a beautiful way to honor Kathleen. I especially recognize Governor Bell Edwards and our First Lady Donna. And I thank you and your staff for all the work you have done in trying to honor such great a woman of faith. This morning as we gather, we gather in the greatest prayer that is given to us as a church. We acknowledge that the Mass, the celebration of the Mass, is the highest way of praise. In the spirit of thanksgiving and gratitude, we lift our prayers and praise to God, the God of our lives, the God who strengthened the journey of Kathleen and gave her an ability to pray for Kathleen. We also pray for ourselves. We pray that God's mercy and love will always be before us as we place our hope and trust in his everlasting kindness and goodness. For Kathleen, that God's love and peace may abide in her soul and that she may be counted among the blessed. And for us, that we who grieve, that those of us who carry Troubled hearts and weary spirits may listen.
listen to his words and invite his Holy Spirit to commence healing and restoration and new life into our being, into our souls. So we pray that we may proclaim the words that we heard in the psalm today, that he who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord. We pray that we may truly come to the end of our life and journey, understanding the beautiful gift of righteousness and live in the integrity of that walk of faith. And we pray that our journey may end as Kathleen's did in the words of St. Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. It has been an honor for me to walk spiritually in Kathleen's journey, to recognize this great woman of faith for the last 18 years as her pastor and friend. Her prayer was that she be remembered not by her accomplishments and achievements or by her shortcomings or failures, but that she be remembered as a woman who had deep faith in God, that she understood and lived her sacraments. As governor, she would often daily go to Mass. For she knew that her precious Lord in the gift of the Eucharist was her strength. It renewed her. It guided her, his love. We get her also because of her devotion, her devotion to the mother of God. She came to know Mary through the sorrows of her own life, especially the loss of her beloved Ben. As this family faced their first crises that was a pivotal moment of faith, she enabled them to turn and realize that God loved them and he would never abandon them, that he would carry them in that moment. And as a mother grieving in sorrow, she showed Coach and her children the way to her son. One evening, visiting with Kathleen a few weeks ago, the house was clear, someone had picked up coach, and I had the uh, ability to just sit, and I sat for maybe two hours, and we were talk we was talking about life and how our lives are filled with blessings, and oftentimes people can't see the blessings that are before them. And she asked me, who are the great women in your life? And she said, do you ever pray for them? And I said, well, you know, I, I am so blessed to have a mother who teaches me about humility and love. And I have never remembered in my whole life my mother asking her children for anything. She's always been that servant. Then she said, who are the other women in your life that have touched your life? And it gave me the opportunity to discern and to pray and to share with you this prayer of how important these women have been for me and for us in our lives. So there is a woman that I know and I have come to love named Mary. It would be through my own mother that I would learn of her. When I was a child, she taught me how to trust as Mary trusted the Lord. We prayed and we understood her beautiful role chosen among women to enable the world to see the incarnate word in the flesh conceived without sin, she would lead us to an understanding of the, the word fiat. Let it be done according to your will. Her yes would teach us 
in our walk of faith, how to surrender to trust, and to know how to know that God is with us. And Our Lady's promise is ever before us, especially at the hour of our death. There is a woman that I've come to know and love named Teresa of Lisieux. I was drawn to her as a young man because of her simple way, her childlike spirit. I was simple. I was childlike into my adulthood. But she taught me how to love unconditionally. And when she would be tested by some of her own sisters, she would choose the higher way of love. She became the little flower, recognized by many because of her love of Christ. But then I found out that in a special way, God would connect me to her. My parents would be married on the day of her feast, October 1st. When I was born, the day of my baptism would be October the 1st, the day of her first feast day. My first assignment as a priest to the diocese would be at St. Teresa in Abbeville. And my second assignment would be at Our Lady of Wisdom Catholic Student Center and the day would begin on October the 1st. Open your eyes, my brothers and sisters. See God's presence around you and the great saints that he placed for you and I to know that we are not alone. There's a woman that I know and I have come to love named Catherine Drexel. Born in Philadelphia, she inherited millions of dollars to her father, her family. She traveled across the South and Western state and her heart was moved to see so many Native Americans and African Americans who lived in poverty, especially the poverty of spirituality. As she journeyed to Europe, one day she met Pope Leo XIII, and she went and she told him that you must send missionaries to the United States, especially for the Native Americans and African Americans, that they know the gospel. And he told her, you go and become a missionary. Well, little did he know that her spirit would be so moved to discern the will of God that she would come back and transform the area, the area of our United States that was struggling to give witness to the faith. And through her generosity and kindness, she would begin to build schools. And she would begin to offer diocese funds to provide ministry for minorities. That same St. Catherine Drexel came to this cathedral and she sat and she prayed here. We was blessed by a diocese that she would begin to give funds so African-American churches could be built. Holy Rosary Institute, Xavier University was all done by her generosity and her kindness. I would be blessed by a saint in my presence again through my ancestors. She would sit at the table of my great-grandfather, Sostan Arsenault, and she would invite him to work towards the cause of education. And together, they would build a Catholic school on his property. There's a woman that I know named Thea Bowman. Through the Institute of Black Catholics and New Orleans at Xavier University, she was a teacher of mine. She has just been announced as a servant of God by the Bishop's Conference in the fall of 2018. Sister Thea stretched me. 
I thought she was hard, but she saw something inside of me that needed to be pushed. She called everyone to embrace the beautiful gift of their culture and their ancestors. She challenged everyone to be authentic in their plight before God. And she said that true holiness was the ability to be authentic in who you were as a child of God and how you distribute that witness to the world through your ancestors, through your culture, and the family that God gave you. Sister Thea challenged me to become stronger and to trust in God's divine plan. There's a woman that I know named Kathleen Babino Blanco. As the pastor of Our Lady of Wisdom Catholic Student Center, one day she greeted me and she told me that I was gifted. I smiled at her and I says, oh, pray for me, I don't think so. And she reminded me, every child is gifted. Every person has a purpose. Don't take it for granted, Father. You are blessed and you are gifted. We gather here today to honor this great woman because she had the ability to see the good in every soul in which she encountered. Whether it was of her political party, people of passion, people who judged her unfairly, she had the ability to stand in grace and accept them for who they were. That's why we celebrate her life today. She had the ability to see in little children the beautiful gift of life and the call for every child to have a proper education. And she worked hard towards making that a reality in our great state. For Kathleen, the child in the womb of a mother was sacred, but she also remembered the child in the tomb of poverty. And she worked towards helping every child to receive the proper education that they would rise and understand their purpose and understand that God loved them. For Kathleen, the elderly person that was secured by the blessing of their lives and with prosperity and wealth was very important. But she also saw the elderly where Social Security became the own, only source of their means of existing. And she tried through health care and her works to meet the needs of the most vulnerable, the poor. Then the storm came, a storm that no one likes to talk about. A storm that I believe that God in his divine providence ordered and commanded that we would have a mother to guide us in the midst of the storm. And at the end of politics, at the end of pointing fingers, at the end of this dark night of our state, the whole country would rise and learn that we had something in common, that every soul, that every individual, that every spirit must be attended to, and that we must push aside our own passions and think of the good of the body of Christ. And Kathleen was, would be the person that would commence the healing and the renewal of our beautiful state of Louisiana. She would see there was a need for people to find hope in something. And along with Mr. Benson, she would give the people the ability to find joy because joy is where we begin to gather and celebrate. And she would restore our Cajun dome and our saints would remain here. And in the only a few months later, the saints would go marching in into a Super Bowl. 
Coincidence or providence? If you don't have anything to hope in or for for, how do you rise? Well, we rise when we open our hearts and recognize the fragility of humanity. We rise when we open our spirits and allow the Holy Spirit to give us the ability to set aside our differences and to commence healing and restoring souls and businesses. We rise when we allow the Holy Spirit to give us the ability to be authentic and to know that each and every one of us have a purpose. So these last few weeks and days have been so precious for me. It has been difficult at times to see her suffer, but there was a spirit in her that wanted to suffer and offer that suffering for her family that meant so much to her and for her great state of Louisiana that she loved. Kathleen put pressure on me like she would do to many. She said, Father, I want you to celebrate and preach the homily. And I said, Kathleen, I'm sure there are going to be bishops who are going to be there. She said, do you want me to make a phone call? I'm sorry, bishops. I said, Kathleen, do you know how difficult that will be for me to pre preach in the midst of the archbishop and other bishops there and my brother priests? She said, you remember what I first told you when I met you? You're gifted and blessed. Never let anyone take that away from you. Then she challenged me again. She said, I want you to sing a song. I said, oh, Kathleen, that's not going to go with <laughs> Father Blanda, who is a liturgical person here. I can imagine telling him that I'm singing a song. He's going to say, well, it's up to you, but I'm out of this. <laughs> and I said, I will try. So in closing this Mass, this homily, I share the words of this song to me that speaks of our daughter of Louisiana, our mother of Louisiana, Kathleen. And I pray that we can truly look deep in our souls and allow the Holy Spirit to give us the ability to rise and give witness to who we are as a people of this great state, but especially a people of Acadiana and a people of faith. The song is called the Servant's Song. Let me be your servant. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. We are pilgrims on a journey, brothers, sisters on the road. We are here to help each other walk the mile and bear the load. I will hold the Christ light for you in the night time of your fear. I will hold my hand out to you. Speak the peace you long to hear. I will weep when you are weeping, when you laugh laugh with you. I will share your joy and sorrows till we've seen this journey through. When we sing to God in heaven, we shall find 
such harmony. Bond of all we've known together, of Christ's love and agony. Let me be your servant. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. Eternal light shine upon you, O, o Kathleen. May perpetual light be upon you, and may you rest in peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. I invite you to please stand as we continue our Mass with our prayers. My brothers and sisters, Jesus is risen from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father where he intercedes for his church, confident that God hears the voices of those who trust in the Lord Jesus. We join our prayers to his. In baptism, Kathleen received the light of Christ. Scatter the darkness now and lead her over the waters of death. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayers. The family and friends of Kathleen seek comfort and consolation. Heal their pain and dispel the darkness and doubt that come from grief. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. For all who minister to the human family through public service, may the Holy Spirit guide them to provide for the common good of all, especially the most vulnerable under their care. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayers. We are assembled here in faith and confidence to pray for our sister Kathleen, strengthen our hope so that we live in the expectation of your Son's coming. May all who have fallen asleep in Christ behold your face to face. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, giver of peace and healer of souls, hear the prayer of the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and the voices of your people, whose lives was purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Forgive the sins of all who sleep in Christ and grant them a place in your eternal kingdom. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
pray, my sisters and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Be near, O Lord, we pray to your servant Kathleen, on whose funeral day we offer this sacrifice of conciliation, so that should any stain of sin have clung to her, or any human fault have affected her, it may by your loving gift be forgiven and wiped away through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In him the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. Come for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and enter willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me.
the mystery of faith. We proclaim. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, and Douglas, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember your servant, Kathleen, whom you have called from this world to yourself. Grant that she, who was united with your son in a death like his, may also be one with him in his resurrection. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, St. John the Evangelist, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your 
Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. May the body of Christ keep me safe for eternal life.
Let us pray. Lord God, whose Son loved us in the sacrament of his body, food for the journey, mercifully grant that strengthened by it, our sister Kathleen may come to the eternal table of Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to please be seated as we have reflections from David Begno. Good morning. My name is David Begno. I am a journalist for CBS News. Kathleen Begno Blanco's mantra was, I gave it my all. About six months after she wrote that letter to the people of Louisiana, announcing her terminal diagnosis, I contacted one of her daughters. I had what I hoped would be a gift for them. It was actually from their mom. Videos that they could watch after she was gone in which she shared stories about her life and about theirs. As a young reporter, I covered Governor Blanco's election night party and followed her career. Having grown up in Acadiana, I was fascinated by her trailblazing legacy. So I asked her brother Pilar if the governor would sit down with me for an interview. In journalism, we never give interview subjects the chance to give us questions in advance. We certainly don't even discuss what questions we're going to ask them. But this was different. This wasn't going to be journalism. I suggested that the governor write the questions herself. You see, it was an opportunity to record for posterity the thoughts and memories of the most influential woman in Louisiana's political history. Almost immediately, the governor said yes. And she emailed me a hundred questions. <laughs> we spent nearly 10 hours together over the course of two days. Some of what she, sh she said I will share with you today, with the permission, of course, from her family. Kathleen would tell you she was a free-range country girl growing up in Koto, where smoke from burning sugarcane would ignite her asthma at night. When it woke her up, she would read. She loved to read. The books, she said, opened me up to new worlds, and they gave her ideas of what she could be. She wanted to be a nurse, she wanted to be a doctor, or an airline hostess, but then I'd want to be the pilot, she said. As the oldest child in the family, she was a rule follower. She was a self-starter, a Catholic school girl who learned to speak French on the playground. She loved asparagus. She shot snakes with her BB gun and lived right across the school, right across the street from her grandparents. She loved her country life. Kathleen said being a politician was the last thing she really ever thought about. There's a story she told about her father running for assessor in Iberia Parish. He lost. Four years later, he ran for clerk of court and lost again. Kathleen said after every loss, a family photo was taken. And she remembered telling her brothers, hold your heads up high. You've got to look proud. These are photos which are going on flyers, she would tell them, which will be walked on, stomped on, and driven on so please, hold your head up high. She was 17 when she gave them that advice. She graduated from college in 1964, got engaged, moved to Lafayette, got married, and got pregnant all in that one year. You'll love this story. It's the story of how she and Coach set a wedding date. She told it this way. I thought we'd be getting married in October. But Raymond looked at me and said, are you crazy? I'm coaching football. It's the middle of the season. <laughs> we have to get married before the football season. Kathleen said, well, I asked him, well, when does that 
start? And he said, well, two-a-days starts in June. So we got to start before two-a-days. We got to get married before then. That meant, that meant Kathleen had 30 days to plan her wedding along with her mother. It's one known that she taught school, specifically business, at Brobridge High School. But what you may not know is that she only taught for about six months. She made $222 a month. That was 1965, about $1,800 in today's money. She got pregnant with her first child, Carmen. When she got pregnant, she was told that the school system usually wanted pregnant women to leave the classroom before they started showing. So she left, and she never went back. After Carmen, five more children would enter the world. For 15 years, Kathleen was a stay-at-home mom. She couldn't afford to hire help, so Kathleen was the barber and the hairdresser. She made the kids clothing, even some of coaches. She did most of the minor repairs around the house. I own the drill, she said, pawing at herself, <laughs> smiling at the camera as she said it. She also said Coach was a perfectly spoiled husband. Her words, Coach, her words. She said he didn't even know how to boil water. One Christmas, Raymond gave her a drill, and she gave him a pot. <laughs> the future gutter was almost 40 when she told Raymond, we can't make it on just one salary anymore. I need to be an adult. I need to get out and explore for myself. So Kathleen applied to be district director for the U.S. Census. She was told whoever scored highest on the test would get the job. She took the test, scored highest, and it was hers. But it lasted less than a year. She told Raymond, that job taught me something about myself. I work too hard to let somebody else go get rich off my work. So she said this. I'm either going to work for myself or I'm going to do public service. The good's going to either come to me or it's going to go for a greater good. She tried to become a state farm agent. The man in Lafayette told her that he had been told by his boss, you can't hire another white guy until you hire a woman or someone who is African American. Kathleen applied, but she never heard back. One day she called the man's secretary and said, I'm going to come to your office and camp out there until he meets with me, because I think he owes me an answer. Well, she got her meeting. And according to Kathleen, the man told her that the job of a state farm agent was too hard for a woman with six kids, and that she was going to lose her husband, and she'd lose her family. Kathleen looked at that man and said, sir, I have six more reasons to succeed than anyone you have ever talked to or interviewed, and I will succeed. Kathleen became the first woman from Acadiana to serve in the Louisiana House of Representatives, the first woman to serve on the Public Service Commission, the second woman to be Lieutenant Governor, and the first and so far only woman to be Governor of our beloved state. She never lost a race. When she came to politics, Kathleen wanted to know three things from her staff before she made a decision. She wanted to know the upside and the downside, who was for it and who was against it, and why they were for it and against it. After Hurricane Katrina, Kathleen made a successful push to take over the schools in New Orleans. She remembered the Orleans Parish School Board being against turning the schools into charter schools. That time, her critics were her supporters. But she put the state's interest above her own. When school board members told her poverty was to blame, the governor looked at them and said, you've been using poverty as an excuse for failure. She heard the critics question her priorities when two months after Katrina, she took a risk and approved the money to rebuild the Superdome. She wanted to keep the saints in New Orleans, New Orleans, but she wanted the dome to become a visible sign of a city bouncing back. It proved to be the right call. Kathleen will be remembered for authenticity and compassion. After Katrina, Governor Blanco wanted to go to the Superdome to meet with survivors. 
Her security detail didn't like the idea. Neither did Coach. Kathleen wanted to go, and so she went. To hug, to hold, and to console the people of New Orleans. Kathleen had a way of making people feel that they were important. A way of making you feel that you were heard. She connected with people through her eyes that you didn't forget. She inspired people with the courage she showed when she allowed herself to be publicly vulnerable. And she was impactful with her willingness to talk about tragedy. By now, Many of you have heard about the story of the last question at the last debate, when Kathleen and her opponent were asked about a defining moment in their life. Here's what you may not know. Kathleen expected that question, not because anyone sent her the questions ahead of time, but because she had watched those debates over and over to prepare. She had watched the moderator, studied his questions, and knew that his last question was usually that one. So she was ready. She wasn't surprised, and she spoke from the heart. When she talked about the death of Ben, how it devastated her family but brought them together without ruining her marriage or her family, advisors told her based on that question she would be the next governor of Louisiana. During our conversations, she left messages for her children and her grandchildren offering them this advice. Show honest respect for people. Give them a minute of your full attention. Her kids will know this, two of Kathleen's favorite quotes hung in the house. Grow where you're planted. And if you're getting ready to get run out of town, jump in front of the crowd and make it look like a parade. was not perfect. She knew it, but she also wanted everybody to know she was blessed. She wanted her family to know this. Love never dies. She said, we will be united, and it will be through love. This is a direct quote. I know it's God's work that I was asked to do. I did it with all my heart and soul. I have no regret. I'm glad was the governor. I'm glad I had six kids, that I married the man that I married. My life has truly been charmed and wonderful in so many ways. I did work that was necessary and meaningful. She went on to say, tell them to let God push them and pull them. Go forward with your head held high and do the right things for yourselves and for all those around you. For those people you love, she said, and even for those you don't. Ladies and gentlemen, let it be known, and may it always be remembered, that Kathleen Babineau Blanco was, by all accounts, an ethical beacon who never intentionally misguided a voter, a family member, or a friend. As she said, I gave it my all, and I suspect she would ask us to do the same.
it was a shame. They whipped and they stripped and they hung me high and they left me there on a cross to die. to the last farewell. There is sadness in parting, but we take comfort in the hope that one day we shall see her again and enjoy in her friendship. Although this congregation will disperse in sorrow, the mercy of God will gather us together again in the joy of his kingdom. Therefore, let us console one another in the faith of Jesus Christ.
gifts of God come to her aid. Hasten to meet her angels of the Lord. Receive her soul and present to God the Most High. May Christ, who call you, take you to himself. May angels lead you to the bosom of Abraham. Receive her soul and present her to God the Most High. Eternal rest grant unto her, O Lord, and let the life shine upon her. Receive your soul, present her to God. Into your hands, Father of mercy, we commend our sister Kathleen in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died with Christ, she will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings in which you have bestowed upon Kathleen in this life. There are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn towards us and listen to our prayers and open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and our sister Kathleen forever. In peace, let us now take the body of our sister to her place of rest.